Section thirty seven of the Houses of Lancaster and York by James Gairdner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter eight, part eight. Fate of Clarence, the Scotch War, death of Edward. It might have been supposed that the House of York was now securely seated upon the throne, and so far as regarded Edward himself, nothing more occurred to disturb his possession. But the family divisions, which had already sprung up, pursued that house ultimately to its ruin. The breach between the king and his brother Clarence, it soon appeared, was only superficially healed over. A quarrel also took place between Clarence and his other brother, Richard, Duke of Gloucester. After the death of Edward, Prince of Wales, the son of King Henry at Tewkesbury, his widow Anne, who it will be remembered was a daughter of Warwick the Kingmaker, was sought by Gloucester in marriage. But Clarence, who had married her elder sister, opposed his suit and attempted to conceal her. Richard, however, discovered her in London in the disguise of a cookmaid and had her removed to the sanctuary of St. Martin's. When Clarence was no longer able to prevent the match, he still refused to divide with his brother the inheritance of their father-in-law, the Earl of Warwick. By the mediation of Edward the matter was at length settled, and an act was passed in Parliament making a division of Warwick's lands between the royal brothers, with very little consideration for the rights of his surviving countess. But in the course of a few years, symptoms of the old ill-will broke out between the Duke of Clarence and Edward himself. On the death of Charles, Duke of Burgundy, Clarence, who was then a widower, was desirous to marry his daughter and heiress Mary. Such a match would have made him a powerful continental prince, and his suit was favoured by his sister Margaret, the widow of the duke. But Edward threw every obstacle in the way. This, in addition to some former injuries real or supposed, embittered Clarence against his brother in a way he did not care to conceal. At last, some gentlemen of his household, having been accused of sorcery, condemned and executed, Clarence, before the king's council, protested his belief in their innocence. This step was treated by the king as dangerous to the administration of justice, and he caused his brother to be arrested and committed to the tower. When Parliament met in the beginning of the year 1478, Clarence was impeached of treason by his own brother before the House of Peers. No other accuser stepped forward but the king himself. But the whole of his past intrigues and rebellions were now brought up against him. It was related in the indictment how he had been already pardoned the most serious offenses, and yet had conspired again against his brother. It was set forth also how at one time, for the gratification of his ambition, he had not hesitated to cast a stigma upon his own mother, declaring his brother Edward illegitimate, and himself the true heir to his father. With these, a number of other circumstances were related, all tending to show that he made it still his aim to supplant King Edward. The lords found Clarence guilty, and he was condemned to death on February 7, 1478. Execution of the sentence was, however, delayed for several days, until the Speaker of the House of Commons, coming to the bar of the Lords, desired that the matter might be brought to a conclusion. Shortly afterwards, the Duke was put to death within the Tower in a manner so very secret, that although the day was known, the kind of death he suffered was a matter of uncertainty. A singular report, however, got abroad that he had been drowned in a butt of Malmsey wine. Perhaps the very secrecy of the execution, if such it might be called, was owing to Edward's reluctance to carry out the sentence, for there is reason to believe, after all, that the whole proceedings were painful to him. 
After the death of Clarence, it is said, when any man besought the king for the pardon of an offender, he would exclaim, O oh, unfortunate brother, that no man would ask pardon for thee. But whatever the effect on Edward's peace of mind, the removal of Clarence contributed to the quiet of his kingdom. For he had been beyond all question, factious and turbulent in the extreme. Yet he had some qualities which won him the favor of the multitude and made him a popular idol. His popularity, too, was all the more dangerous to Edward because, according to an act of Parliament, passed during the restoration of Henry the Sixth, Clarence ought to have been the legitimate king after the death of Edward, Prince of Wales. Of this act of Parliament, of course, Edward did not recognize the authority, but he felt it necessary now to get his Parliament to repeal it. There is little else that is memorable in Edward's reign except a war with Scotland that broke out at the close of it. To strengthen his family upon the throne, Edward had arranged marriages for most of his children with foreign princes, and while his eldest daughter Elizabeth was contracted by treaty to the Dauphin, Cecily the Third was engaged to Prince James, the eldest son of James the Third of Scotland. In consideration of this latter match, Edward had agreed to give with his daughter a dower of twenty thousand marks, of which three installments had already been paid in advance, though the parties had not yet arrived at a marriageable age. Some misunderstanding, however, broke out between the two kings, partly, as it is supposed, through the intrigues of Louis XI, who, as the time drew near when the Dauphin ought to have claimed his bride, showed a great disposition to evade his own obligations to England. But whatever may have been the exact cause, Edward and James each accused the other of unfair dealing, and James, in the spring of 1480, actually marched an army across the borders into Northumberland. The King of England, for his part, commissioned his brother Richard, Duke of Gloucester, to lead his forces against the invader. At the same time, the domestic state of Scotland gave Edward great advantages. James III was a king distinguished for a love of art and science, which his nobles held in great contempt. His court was the resort of musicians and architects, by whose advice he was supposed to be governed in matters affecting the wheel of his kingdom. His own brothers were disaffected to him. One of them, the Earl of Mar, is said to have been put to death by his orders. The other, Alexander, Duke of Albany, escaped to France, but was invited over to England by Edward, with whom he entered into a treaty of assistance to make himself King of Scotland, pretending that his brother was illegitimate. June 11th, 1482. He engaged on obtaining his kingdom to deliver up Berwick to the English, and he went with the Duke of Gloucester to lay siege to that town which surrendered with very little resistance. James, meanwhile, was advancing at the head of his forces to make a new inroad on the English border, but having arrived at Lauder, a conference was held in the church by his discontented lords, who in the end seized seven of the detested favorites and hanged them over the bridge. The Scotch army was then disbanded, and the king conveyed back to Edinburgh by the nobles, who extorted from him a full pardon for what he had done. Albany and Gloucester then marched on to Edinburgh and were received within the city as friends. But Albany was well aware that his title to the crown of Scotland would not be supported within the realm itself. A compromise was therefore arranged, and a peace was concluded between all parties. The sums advanced by Edward for his daughter's dowry were repaid, and Berwick was given up to England. Albany, however, very soon afterwards renewed his intrigues with Edward, as a consequence of which he was attainted by the Parliament of Scotland. As for Edward, 
he had scarcely composed this dispute with Scotland when he met with a cruel mortification at the hands of Louis XI of France. It is evident that that wily monarch had never really intended the match between the Dauphin and the Princess Elizabeth to take effect. Edward, on the other hand, had been induced by the prospect of this alliance to make peace with Louis on more easy terms, perhaps, than he might otherwise have granted. Time passed away, however, and Louis took no steps to bring the matter to a conclusion, till at last, a great opportunity presented itself of violating his engagement openly. Charles the Bold, Duke of Burgundy, had been defeated and slain at Nancy in 1477. He left an only daughter, Mary, to inherit his rich dominions, which included not only Burgundy, but a great part of the Low Countries. Her territories were invaded by Louis, but she married Maximilian of Austria, son of the Emperor Frederick III, who, though the poorest prince of Europe, was a very good soldier, and recovered for her several places that had submitted to the French. The Duchess Mary, however, was unexpectedly cut off in March 1482 by a fall from her horse. She left two young children, Philip and Margaret, of whom the former was heir to the duchy, but their father Maximilian was despised by the Flemings, and had no means of making his authority respected. The men of Ghent, who were secretly encouraged by Louis, took possession of his children, and compelled him to govern as they pleased, till in the end he was driven to conclude with the French king a treaty at Arras, by which Margaret was to be married to the Dauphin, and to have as her dower some of the most valuable lands in Burgundy, taken from the inheritance of her brother Philip. This treaty was concluded on December 23, 1482. The mortification it gave to Edward was extreme, and French writers say that he died of the disappointment. Whether that be the case or not, he did not survive it four months, for he died on April 9, 1483. With many great defects in his character, he was a king more in sympathy with his people than any sovereign that had been seen in England since the days of Edward III. Handsome in person and affable in manner, he was always easy to be approached. He was a great favorite with the citizens of London, and rather too much so with their wives. Careless and self-indulgent, he was greatly given to licentiousness, and forgot the affairs of his kingdom in pursuing his own pleasures. He was a good soldier, but a bad general, a jovial companion, but a poor statesman. His personal influence with his subjects was higher, perhaps, than that of any of his predecessors, but he cannot be regarded as by any means a great king. End of section 37《Section 38 of the Houses of Lancaster and York by James Gairdner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 9 Edward V. Edward, the son and heir of the deceased king, was at Ludlow on the borders of Wales when his father died. He had been sent thither as Prince of Wales to hold a court and keep the country in good order, for which purpose a council had been assigned to him, consisting originally of his uncles, the Dukes of Clarence and Gloucester, his maternal uncle, Anthony Earl Rivers, Lord Hastings, and several others. But the Duke of Clarence was dead, the Duke of Gloucester in the north, and Lord Hastings in London so that when young Edward, who was only in his thirteenth year, received the news of his own accession to the throne, he was surrounded principally by his mother's relations. Now it was most unfortunate for the young king himself that both his mother and her kinsfolk were looked upon with dislike and jealousy by the old nobility, 
The Woodvilles had always been regarded as upstarts, but under the reign of the late king, no loyal subject could say anything against them. The council in London, however, were of opinion that it would be advisable to remove the new king entirely from the influence of his maternal relatives. And though the queen dowager desired that he should be brought up to London with as large an escort as possible, the lords could not be persuaded to sanction a stronger retinue than was needed for his personal safety. Lord Hastings, who was governor of Calais, took alarm and talked of departing immediately across the sea. The Queen's friends were obliged to give assurances that no large force should come up, and orders were sent down to Ludlow that the company should on no account exceed two thousand horse. On his deathbed, the late king had bequeathed the care of the young prince in his kingdom, more especially to his brother Richard, Duke of Gloucester. When, therefore, tidings of Edward's death were sent into the north, Richard at once set out for London. He reached Northampton on April 29th and found that the young king had been there that day before him and had passed on to Stony Stratford ten miles further on. He was met, however, by the young king's uncle and half-brother, the Earl Rivers, and Lord Richard Grey, who had ridden back to pay their respects to him in Edward's name. Henry, Duke of Buckingham, also joined the party. He, it is said, had been already in communication with Gloucester. With apparent cordiality, all sat down together to supper. But after the retirement of Rivers and Grey, the two dukes held a consultation, the result of which was that early next morning they caused their guests to be arrested and pushed on to Stony Stratford before the royal party had time to get away. They obtained an audience of the young king, and in his presence accused his uncle Rivers and his two half-brothers, the Marquis of Dorset and Lord Richard Grey, of a design to usurp the government and oppress the old nobility. Dorset, it seems, who was constable of the tower, had taken supplies of arms and money out of that fortress and fitted out a small fleet, while Rivers and Lord Richard Grey had shown a most suspicious haste in bringing young Edward up to London. The poor lad could not believe these accusations and burst into tears on hearing them. The two dukes, however, caused Rivers and Grey, with two other gentlemen of his household, to be sent in custody into Yorkshire, where, after being confined for nearly two months in different places, they were ultimately beheaded at Pumfret. Meanwhile, the young king continued his journey to London in the company of his uncle, Gloucester, and the Duke of Buckingham. Alarm had been at first created in the city by the news of the arrests made at Northampton, but the fact became known that large quantities of armor and weapons were found among the baggage of rivers and the king's attendants, and this discovery produced an impression that their imprisonment was perfectly justified. The mayor and citizens accordingly met the young king and his uncle at Hornsea Park and conducted him into the city. They entered it on May 4th, 1483, a day that had been originally set apart for Edward's coronation. That ceremony was now deferred till June 22nd. Meanwhile, the Duke of Gloucester was declared protector of the young king and his kingdom and a parliament was summoned to assemble three days after the coronation. But the Queen Mother, Elizabeth Woodville, on hearing that her brother and her son had been arrested at Northampton, had quitted Westminster Palace and gone into the adjoining sanctuary. Here Rotherham, Archbishop of York, who had been Lord Chancellor at the death of Edward IV, brought her the great seal of England as a guarantee that nothing should be done against the interest of her son. This act was a grave official misdemeanor, which he had soon caused to repent, for the office of Chancellor was taken from him, and a censure was passed upon him by the council for letting the seal go out of his custody. The Queen's influence, which had been so great during the reign of her husband, was now completely at an end, 
and the old nobility rejoiced at having got rid of her ascendancy, a revolution, as Lord Hastings triumphantly remarked, that had cost no more blood than a cut finger. Hastings, indeed, had been a principal cause of this change, but notwithstanding his open boast, he seems very soon to have repented it, and held meetings with the Queen's friends at St. Paul's to consider how to get the King out of Richard's power. Richard at the same time held meetings with his supporters at Crosby's place in Bishopsgate Street, where he then resided. At last, at a council held within the tower, he caused Hastings suddenly to be arrested and immediately after beheaded on Tower Green. Morton, Bishop of Ely, and Archbishop Rotherham were also placed in confinement. The Dukes of Gloucester and Buckingham then sent for the principal citizens, and appearing before them in rusty armour, which they had suddenly put on, explained that they had only that morning heard of a conspiracy formed against them by Hastings and others who would have killed the protector and taken the government into their own hands. This sudden execution of one who to outward appearance had been all along most friendly to the two dukes against whom he was said to have conspired occasioned general astonishment. The act was certainly quite illegal, and it is hard to see how it could have been necessary even in self-defense. Read by the light of subsequent events, it seems to admit only of one interpretation, that Richard was at this time plotting his own elevation to the throne, and finding that Hastings could not be relied on to second his designs, had determined to remove him. But an impression does seem to have been conveyed which is stated as a simple fact in a history written many years after, that Richard on this occasion only anticipated violence by equally high-handed measures of his own. The view, however, which has obtained most general currency is derived from a very graphic account of the scene in the council chamber written by Sir Thomas Moore, who unquestionably obtained his information from Cardinal Morton, at that time Bishop of Ely, one of the persons then arrested by the protector. According to this narrative, the blow which fell upon Hastings altogether took him by surprise. The story is, in brief, as follows. The protector made his appearance in the council chamber about nine o'clock in the morning. His manner was gracious. He blamed his own laziness for not coming earlier, and turning to Morton, Bishop of Ely said, my lord, you have very good strawberries in your garden at Holborn. I pray you let us have a mess of them. After this, having opened the business of the council and engaged the lords in conversation, he took leave of them for a time. Between ten and eleven o'clock he returned. His manner was altogether altered, and as he took his seat he frowned on the assembly and bit his lips. After a pause he asked, what punishment they deserved, who had conspired against the life of one so nearly related to the king as himself, and entrusted with the government of the kingdom. The council was dumbfounded, but Hastings, presuming on his familiarity with the protector, said they deserved the punishment of traitors. That sorceress, my brother's wife, exclaimed Richard, and others with her, see how they have wasted my body by their sorcery and witchcraft. And as he spoke, he barred his left arm and showed it to the council, shrunk and withered, as it always had been. He added that one of the accomplices of the Queen Dowager in this business was Jane Shore, who had been one of the mistresses of the late king, her husband, and since his death had become the mistress of Hastings. The accusation against the Queen Dowager, we are told, was not at all displeasing to Hastings, who regarded her with deadly hatred. But when the protector mentioned the name of Shore's wife, he felt very differently. He, however, ventured to reply, Certainly, my lords, if they have done so heinously, they are worthy of heinous punishment. What? exclaimed Richard. Dost thou serve me with ifs and ands? 
I tell thee they have done it, and that I will make good on thy body, traitor. On this he struck his fist upon the council table with great force. Armed men rushed in, crying treason. Hastings and some others, including Morton, were arrested, and Lord Stanley had a blow aimed at his head with a pole-axe. Richard then bade Hastings instantly prepare for death, swearing by St. Paul that he would not die until he had seen his head off. He accordingly made his confession to the first priest that could be found. A log of timber intended for some repairs in the tower served the purpose of a block, and before noon his head was severed from his body. In what manner Jane Shore had incurred the protector's displeasure it is difficult to understand. Richard accused her of witchcraft and of being an accomplice of Hastings in a scheme for his destruction, on which charges he sent her to prison and stripped her of almost all her property. After a time, however, he handed her over to the Bishop of London to inflict spiritual punishment upon her as an unchaste woman, and she was compelled to do open penance one Sunday, going through the streets in her kirtle with a taper in her hand. The exhibition, however, excited the compassion of the spectators who looked upon her punishment as due only to malice and not to any real desire on Richard's part to promote public morality. Three days before the execution of Hastings, the protector had written to the city of York, desiring a force to be sent up immediately to London to counteract the designs of the Queen Dowager and her friends, whom he accused of conspiring against him and Buckingham, and attempting the ruin of the old nobility. Some hasty levies arrived in consequence in the course of a week or ten days and were mustered in Moorfields. Others were also sent into the north for the execution of Rivers, Lord Richard Grey, and two other gentlemen who had been arrested in accompanying the king up to London. Meanwhile, Richard persuaded the council that his nephew, Richard, Duke of York, who was with the queen, his mother, in sanctuary, should be sent for to take up his residence with the king, his brother. A deputation headed by Cardinal Bourcher, Archbishop of Canterbury, was accordingly sent to the queen, and she delivered the lad into their hands. A letter written a few days after says that he was received by Richard at the star chamber door with many loving words. He was conducted by the cardinal to the tower and was treated with all the honor that became his birth. But neither he nor the king his brother ever left the tower again. On Sunday, June 22nd, the citizens of London were astonished by a sermon delivered at Paul's Cross, a little open-air pulpit which stood at the northeast corner of St. Paul's Churchyard. Here, preachers of distinction often addressed the people on public questions. But the boldness of the preacher on this occasion was quite unprecedented. He was a man of considerable reputation, by name Dr. Shaw. His text was taken from the Book of Wisdom, chapter 4, verse 3, Bastard slips shall not take deep root. And the whole line of his argument was to show that the children of King Edward IV were illegitimate. From this it was inferred that the true right to the crown was in the person of Richard, Duke of Gloucester, who, having arranged to be present during the discourse, was made the object of a special compliment. The people, however, listened in mute astonishment and the preacher seems to have gained little credit for an act which was clearly that of a sycophant. Nevertheless, on the Tuesday following, at a meeting of the Common Council of the City of London in the Guildhall, a message was received from the protector through the medium of the Duke of Buckingham and other lords as to the claim advanced by him to the crown. Buckingham, who spoke with remarkable ability, entered into a statement from which he drew the conclusion that the title of the Duke of Gloucester was preferable to that of his nephew Edward. And although we are told by a city chronicler that the matter of his address was not so much admired as the eloquence with which it was delivered, the mayor and the aldermen certainly proceeded to act upon the information thus given them. A parliament had been summoned to meet on the following day, and it is certain that a meeting of lords and commons actually took place, though owing to some informality, 
it was not afterwards regarded as a true parliament. In this assembly, however, the question of Richard's title was brought forward, and the facts were stated to be as follows. The marriage of Edward IV with Elizabeth Woodville had been invalid from the first. Not only had it been brought about by sorcery and witchcraft, this was gravely alleged in an act of Parliament, but at the very time it took place, Edward was under a pre-contract to marry a certain Lady Eleanor Talbot, daughter of the Earl of Shrewsbury and widow of Lord Butler, and this, according to the canon law, made his marriage to Elizabeth Woodville void. Moreover, the Duke of Clarence had been attainted by Parliament so that none of his children could inherit. Thus Richard was the only true heir of his father, Richard, Duke of York, and of the crown of England, and he was desired by the Lord Spiritual and Temporal, and the Commons then assembled, to assume that to which he was entitled. A deputation consisting of a number of the lords and some of the principal knights, joined by the mayor and aldermen and chief citizens of London, then waited on Richard at Baynard's Castle, the residence of his mother, the Duchess of York, and presented the petition. Richard intimated his acceptance, and next morning, accompanied by a great number of the nobility, proceeded in state to Westminster Hall and afterwards to the Abbey and St. Paul's. From that day he began to reign as king by the name of Richard III. End of Section 38section thirty nine of the houses of lancaster and york by james gairdner this librivox recording is in the public domain read by pamela nagami chapter ten richard the third part one the royal progress murder of the princes from what has been already said it will be seen that the accession or, as it is commonly called, the usurpation of Richard III, was the result of a struggle between different parties among the nobility, in which the ablest and the most high-handed carried the day. Dislike of the Woodvilles was the one common bond by which the greater part of the nobles could be united, and Richard, with his ally the Duke of Buckingham, made use of it for his own purposes. But though this feeling was strong and general enough to give him a complete victory over his opponents, there was no real sympathy between him and the greater part of those who for the moment supported him, and it was inevitable that when he had attained the crown, feelings of a different kind should begin to show themselves. And so we are told expressly by one writer of the time that as soon as he had become king, he lost the hearts of his nobility, insomuch that such as before loved and praised him, and would have jeopardized life and goods with him if he had remained still as protector, now murmured and grudged against him in such wise that few or none favored his party, except it were for dread or for the great gifts that they received of him by mean whereof of he won diverse to follow his mind, the which after deceived him. Yet looking merely to the circumstances of his accession, Richard was not a usurper in the strict sense of the word. He did not seize, but was invited to assume the crown, and the body by which he was invited so to do had all the weight and dignity of a regular parliament. His coronation which was fixed for July 6th, 1483, just ten days after his accession, was celebrated with peculiar magnificence and preceded by a gorgeous procession the day before, in which the greater number of the nobility took part. At this time he made great professions that he should rule with clemency. A day or two before his coronation he entered the court of King's Bench, and sat down in the seat of the Chief Justice, from which he proclaimed a general amnesty for all offences against himself. In token of his sincerity, he also sent for one Sir John Fogg, who had notoriously incurred his displeasure, 
and taken refuge in a neighbouring sanctuary. Fogg had been a member of his brother King Edward's council, and had filled the office of treasurer of the household during his reign. On being sent for, he came out of sanctuary, and Richard, in the presence of all the people, took him openly by the hand. To confirm the good impression which these and other acts were calculated to make upon his subjects, Richard then set out upon a progress through the Midland and Northern counties. His course lay in the first place through Windsor, Reading, and Oxford, to Woodstock and Gloucester. At Oxford he met with a magnificent reception in which Bishop Wayne Fleet, the founder of Magdalen College, took a leading part. At Gloucester the city offered him a handsome present or benevolence unsolicited, and the same was done at Worcester, which was the next place he visited. Both of these gifts he declined, as he had already done a similar offer from the metropolis, declaring he would rather have the hearts of his subjects than their money. He went on to Warwick, where he received ambassadors from Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain, and from thence by Coventry, Leicester, and Nottingham, he went on to York, where the citizens had prepared for him a reception of more than ordinary splendor. It has been said that he was crowned a second time in this city, but the truth seems to be merely that he and his queen, who had joined him at Warwick, with the Prince Edward their son, whom he that day created Prince of Wales, walked in a grand procession through the streets with crowns upon their heads. All this display tended to increase his popularity, especially in the north where he had been a long time resident before he became king. But in London and the southern counties, people began to be uneasy about his conduct toward the young princes, his nephews. It is true King Edward himself, out of a confidence which was certainly misplaced, had appointed Richard the guardian of his children after his death. But the mode in which he exercised his rights was exceedingly suspicious. The two young princes were never seen out of the tower, and nobody appears to have known anything about them. Their five sisters remained with their mother in the sanctuary of Westminster. But Richard had caused the sanctuary to be surrounded with a band of armed men, lest any of them should make their escape beyond sea. For it appears that plans had begun to be formed for carrying off one or more of them in disguise, doubts being already entertained whether their two brothers would not be cut off by violence. At length it was announced that even the Duke of Buckingham, who had hitherto been so strong a partisan of Richard, was interested in behalf of the young princes and would put himself at the head of a confederacy for their liberation from the tower. But scarcely had this news got abroad when it was made known that the object of the proposed rising was hopeless, for the princes were no more. No one could tell how or when they had been put to death, but that they had been murdered was the current rumor of the time, and it was not, for it could not be, contradicted. The circumstances of the crime seem in fact to have remained a secret for nearly twenty years, but at length, by the confession of some of the murderers, they were found to be briefly as follows. Some time after Richard had set out upon his progress, he sent a messenger named John Green to Sir Robert Brackenbury, the constable of the tower, commanding him to put his two young nephews to death. This order Brackenbury would not obey, and Green returned to his master at Warwick. Richard was greatly mortified, but sent one Sir James Tyrrell to London with a warrant to Brackenbury to deliver up to him for one night all the keys of the tower. Tyrrell thus took the place into his keeping and engaged the services of Miles Forrest, one of those who kept the prince's chamber, and John Dighton, his own groom, to carry out the wishes of the tyrant. These men entered the chamber when the two unfortunate lads were asleep, and smothered them under pillows. Then, having called Sir James to see the bodies, 
buried them at the foot of a staircase. Brackenbury, it was supposed, caused them afterwards to be removed and buried secretly in some more suitable place, but as he was dead long before the story got abroad, the place could never be ascertained. The fact, however, appears to have been that they were not removed at all, for nearly two hundred years later, two skeletons corresponding to the age of the murdered youths were found in the very position where they were said to have been originally buried, at the foot of a staircase in the tower. Unscrupulous as Richard was, the remorse that overtook him after this dreadful crime appears to have been very terrible indeed. I have heard, wrote Sir Thomas More, by credible report of such as were secret with his chamberers, that after this abominable deed done, he never had quiet in his mind. He never thought himself sure. When he went abroad, his eyes whirled about, his body privily fenced, his hand ever on his dagger, his countenance and manner like one always ready to strike again. He took ill rest at nights, lay long waking and musing, sore wearied with care and watch, he rather slumbered than slept. Troubled with fearful dreams, suddenly sometimes started he up, leapt out of his bed and ran about the chamber. So was his restless heart continually tossed and tumbled with the tedious impression and stormy remembrance of his most abominable deed. End of section 39《Section 40 of the Houses of Lancaster and York by James Gairdner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 10, Part 2 The Rebellion of Buckingham. The news of the murder excited throughout the country strong feelings of grief and indignation. But to those implicated in the conspiracy for the liberation of the princes, it was more especially alarming. A new object, however, was presently supplied to them. The male issue of Edward IV being now extinct, a project was formed for marrying his eldest daughter Elizabeth to Henry, Earl of Richmond, a refugee in Brittany, who was regarded as the head of the deposed House of Lancaster, and Buckingham wrote to the Earl to cross the seas while he and others in England should make an insurrection in his favour. Now it is true, the direct male line of the House of Lancaster died with King Henry the Sixth, but this Earl of Richmond was descended from John of Gaunt through his mother, Margaret Beaufort, in the manner shown in the subjoined pedigree. He was also, by the father's side, a nephew of Henry the Sixth. But this relationship, it will be seen, gave him no claim to the crown. On the other hand, his claim through the Beauforts was a little doubtful, as John Beaufort, Earl of Somerset, the first of the line, was born before the marriage of his father John of Gaunt with his mother Catherine Swinford. The Beauforts, it is true, had been made legitimate by an act of Parliament, but there was still some question whether they were not excluded from the crown. Richmond, however, was undoubtedly, after the death of Henry the Sixth, the most direct representative of the line of John of Gaunt, and had been carried over to Brittany by his uncle, the Earl of Pembroke, soon after the final overthrow of the Lancastrians at Tewkesbury. Now it will be seen that the Duke of Buckingham was also descended from the Beauforts, and it is said that owing to this fact, he had thought at one time of laying claim to the crown himself. It is also supposed that he had received a private disappointment from King Richard, which had done much to cool the friendship he had hitherto entertained towards him. But he was further greatly influenced by some conversations that he held with Morton, Bishop of Ely, whom Richard had delivered to his custody after his accession and whom he kept as a prisoner at Brecknock. Morton very soon discovered his disaffection toward King Richard, 
and led him gradually into the design of calling over the Earl of Richmond from Brittany and marrying him to the Princess Elizabeth. This project was communicated to the Countess of Richmond, the Earl's mother, and to the Queen Dowager, by both of whom it was warmly approved. The Marquis of Dorset and others of the Woodville party arranged with Buckingham a number of simultaneous risings to take place on October 18th, 1483, in the south and west of England, and the Earl of Richmond was expected at the same time to land on the southern coast and lead the movement in person. On the day appointed accordingly, the partisans of Henry Tudor, Earl of Richmond, took up arms under different leaders in Kent, in Berkshire, at Salisbury, and at Exeter. The Duke of Buckingham also took the field that day at Brecknock. The king seems to have been nearly taken by surprise, but the news of the intended outbreak had reached him a week before it took place, at Lincoln. He wrote in great haste to his chancellor to bring or send immediately the great seal, in order that he might make out commissions of array. Hastening southwards, he received it at Grantham on the 19th. Commissions were immediately sent out to levy troops in the king's name, and a singular proclamation was issued on the 23rd, endeavouring to excite public indignation against his opponents as men of immoral lives, who, despising the general pardon issued by the king for political offences, were leagued together for the maintenance of vice and the indulgence of unlawful pleasures. The Marquis of Dorset, it seems, had, since the death of Hastings, taken Jane Shore into his keeping, and according to this proclamation had been guilty of many other acts of immorality. Great rewards were offered by this proclamation for the capture of Buckingham, Dorset, and the bishops of Ely and Salisbury. For Bishop Morton, it should be mentioned, after his conversations with Buckingham, had contrived to make his escape from Brecknock into the Isle of Ely, and soon after got beyond sea. The Bishop of Salisbury was a brother of Queen Elizabeth Woodville. One thousand pounds in money, or an estate in land worth one hundred pounds a year, was the price set upon the head of Buckingham. Such an amount was probably equal in value to about twelve thousand pounds in modern money, or twelve hundred pounds a year in land. For the others, the sums offered were not quite so large. Buckingham had boasted that he had as many liveries of the Stafford knot as Warwick the kingmaker had of his cognizance, the bare and ragged staff. But however numerous the forces he could bring into the field, he was utterly unable to make use of them. Two gentlemen named Thomas Vaughan and Humphrey Stafford watched the roads about Brecknock to prevent his leaving Wales, and destroyed all the bridges across the Severn. Heavy rains then swelled the rivers and made a passage utterly impracticable. A great part of the land was flooded, provisions were not to be obtained, and the men of Buckingham disbanded. The Duke himself retired into Shropshire, and took refuge with one of his retainers named Ralph Bannister, who, tempted by the great reward offered for his apprehension, delivered him up to the sheriff of the county. Richard, meanwhile, had been collecting forces and advancing toward the west of England. Buckingham, on his capture, was brought to him at Salisbury, and the king gave orders for his instant execution. Richard acted wisely in refusing him an interview, for which he made urgent request for it seems to have been well known afterwards that he intended to have stabbed him to the heart. The capture and death of Buckingham completely put an end to the rebellion. Dorset and some of the other leaders at once abandoned all hope of resistance and fled to Brittany. A few others were taken and executed, among the rest Sir Thomas St. Ledger, who had married the Duchess of Exeter, the king's sister. But the common people were spared. The Earl of Richmond set sail from Brittany, but met with a storm in mid-channel which dispersed his ships, and though his own vessel neared the coast at Poole and at Plymouth, 
he could obtain no satisfactory assurance of a friendly reception on landing. He therefore hoisted sail and recrossed the sea. End of section 40《Section 41 of the Houses of Lancaster and York by James Gairdner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 10, Part 3. Second Invasion of Richmond. Richard's Overthrow and Death. Thus Richard had obtained an almost bloodless triumph. He passed on to Exeter, where he received the congratulations of the citizens, and a purse of two hundred gold nobles was presented to him. In January 1484, a Parliament met at Westminster, which confirmed his title to the crown, and passed an act of attainder against the Earl of Richmond and his adherents. Upwards of ninety persons were by this act branded as traitors and deprived of all their lands and honours. But the Countess of Richmond, Henry's mother, who had been the chief organizer of the whole rebellion, was treated with leniency out of consideration for her husband, Lord Stanley. Her lands were given to her husband for life, and he undertook to be responsible for her conduct in the future. Another act of this Parliament was to abolish the oppressive kind of taxation introduced by Edward IV under the name of benevolences, which, though they were professedly free will offerings, had been really exacted under so much pressure as to reduce many persons from affluence to poverty. Before the Parliament separated, the Lords all took an oath of allegiance, not only to Richard as King, but to his son Edward, Prince of Wales, as heir apparent, to whom they promised fealty after Richard's death. But within a few weeks, the young prince died after a brief illness, and Richard was childless. As the children of Edward IV had been declared illegitimate, and those of the Duke of Clarence could not inherit by reason of their father's attainder, Richard then recognized as his heir John de la Pole, Earl of Lincoln, son of the Duke of Suffolk. Meanwhile, the Earl of Richmond was busy preparing for a second attempt at invasion. On Christmas Day, 1484, he had held a meeting with his principal adherents in Wren Cathedral, where he took oath to marry Princess Elizabeth as soon as he should obtain possession of the crown. Richard made application to the Duke of Brittany to deliver him up into his hands, but the Earl, having received warning, escaped into the dominions of Charles the Eighth, the new King of France, who had just succeeded his father Louis the Eleventh where he was soon rejoined by about three hundred of his followers. Richard, however, endeavoured to defeat his designs in another way. He summoned a council of the Lord Spiritual and Temporal, then in London, together with the Lord Mayor and Aldermen of the city, and took oath in their presence that if the five daughters of Dame Elizabeth Grey, meaning by that name the Queen Dowager, whom he no longer recognised as such, would come out of sanctuary, and placed themselves under his protection, he would not only assure them of life and liberty, but provide them with husbands as they came of age, and give each of them a marriage portion of the value of two hundred marks a year. He also engaged to allow Elizabeth herself a pension of seven hundred marks a year for life. This offer the Queen Dowager and her daughters thought it well to accept, and accordingly came out of sanctuary. It seems extraordinary that after the murder of her sons, the Queen Dowager should ever have been induced to repose the slightest confidence in Richard, and yet there appears to be no doubt of the fact that some time after this she was nearly won over by his blandishments to break off her compact with Henry, whose cause she probably considered hopeless. She wrote to her son, the Marquis of Dorset in France, to withdraw himself from the Earl of Richmond's company, and Dorset had in consequence secretly left Paris, where the Earl was then staying and was hastening toward Flanders on his way to England, when the French King's Council, at the Earl's urgent request, caused his flight to be arrested. It is even asserted that Richard attained such favour with the Queen Dowager, 
that in order to prevent her daughter's marriage with the Earl of Richmond, he proposed, in the expectation of his own queen's death, to marry her himself, and this project, as the chronicles relate, was actually approved by the mother, although very abhorrent to the feelings of the princess herself. Such a story seems almost too monstrous to be believed. Perhaps the truth may be that immediately after his queen's death, Richard did make some advances of the kind, which even under these circumstances were disgraceful enough, and the indignation they aroused may have caused the story to be exaggerated. Certain it is that the king felt it necessary to make a public disavowal of the intention within a very few weeks after his wife's death. But whatever arts Richard used, cajolery, promises, bribes, or threats, to turn enemies into friends or to defeat the plans of his opponents, they never were successful except partially and for a time. Sir Thomas More, a great wit and genius, who in those days was a child, but afterwards wrote a life of King Richard from the information of persons then living, says of him that with large gifts he got him unsteadfast friendship, for which he was fain to pill and spoil in other places, and get him steadfast hatred. Before his brief reign came to an end, he found himself obliged to replenish his empty exchequer by having recourse once more to those detested benevolences which he had promised in Parliament should never again be levied. Such measures, of course, made him more than ever unpopular at home, while the preparations of the Earl of Richmond abroad continually gave him more anxiety. The Earl of Oxford, who had given much trouble to his brother Edward IV, had been committed to the custody of Sir James Blunt, governor of Amis Castle near Calais, brother of the Lord Montjoy. Sir James released his prisoner, and both offered their services to the Earl of Richmond. The castle of Ames was afterwards recovered into the king's hands, but only on condition that the garrison should be allowed to depart with bag and baggage. By repeated proclamations, Richard called upon his subjects to resist the intended invasion of Richmond with all their force. He denounced the Earl and his followers as men who had forsaken their true allegiance and put themselves in subjection to the French king. He pointed out that owing to the illegitimacy of the Beauforts, Henry could have no claim to the crown, and that even on the father's side he was come of bastard blood. He declared that he had bargained to give up for ever all claims hitherto made by the kings of England either to the crown of France, the duchy of Normandy, Gascony, or even Calais. Richmond, however, had sent messages into England by which he was assured of a considerable amount of support, and he borrowed money from the king of France, with which he fitted out a small fleet at Arfleur and embarked for Wales, where his uncle, Jasper Tudor, Earl of Pembroke, possessed great influence. Richard, knowing of the intended invasion, but being uncertain where his enemy might land, had taken up his position in the center of the kingdom. Following a plan first put in use by his brother Edward during the Scotch War, he had stationed messengers at intervals of twenty miles along all the principal roads to the coast to bring him early intelligence but Henry landed on August 1st, 1485, at Milford Haven, at the farthest extremity of South Wales, where perhaps Richard had least expected him, and so small was the force by which he was accompanied that the news did not at first give the king very much anxiety. He professed great satisfaction that his adversary was now coming to bring matters to the test of battle. The earl, however, was among friends from the moment he landed. Pembroke was his native town, and the inhabitants expressed their willingness to serve his uncle, the Earl of Pembroke, as their natural and immediate lord. The very men whom Richard had placed to keep the country against him at once joined his party, and he passed on to Shrewsbury with little or no opposition. The king's unsteadfast friendships, on the other hand, were now rapidly working his ruin. His own attorney general, Morgan Kidwelly, had been in communication with the enemy before he landed. Richard, however, was very naturally suspicious of Lord Stanley, his rival's stepfather. 
who, though he was steward of the royal household, had asked leave shortly before the invasion to go home and visit his family in Lancashire. This the king granted only on the condition that he would send his son George, Lord Strange, to him at Nottingham in his place. Lord Strange was accordingly sent to the king, but when the news arrived of Henry's landing, Richard desired the presence of his father also. Stanley pretended illness, an excuse which could not fail to increase the king's suspicions. His son at the same time made an attempt to escape, and being captured confessed that he himself and his uncle, Sir William Stanley, had formed a project with others to go over to the enemy. But he protested his father's innocence, and assured the king that he would obey his summons. He was made to understand that his own life depended on his doing so, and he wrote a letter to his father accordingly. Richard, having mustered his followers at Nottingham, went on to Leicester to meet his antagonist, and encamped at Bosworth on the night of August 21st. The Earl of Richmond had arrived near the same place with an army of 5,000 men, which is supposed to have been not more than half that of the king. That day, however, Lord Stanley had come to the Earl secretly at Atherston to assure him of his support in the coming battle. He and his brother Sir William were each at the head of a force not far off, and were only temporizing to save the life of his son Lord Strange. This information relieved Henry's mind of much anxiety, for at various times since he landed he had felt serious misgivings about the success of the enterprise. The issue was now to be decided on the following day. Early in the morning, both parties prepared for the battle. Richard arose before daybreak, much agitated, it is said, by dreadful dreams that had haunted his imagination in the night time. But he entered the field wearing his crown upon his head and encouraged his troops with an eloquent harangue. There was, however, treason in his camp, and many of his followers were only seeking an opportunity to desert and take part with the enemy. A warning, indeed, had been conveyed by an unknown hand to his foremost supporter, the Duke of Norfolk, in the following rhyme, which was discovered the night before, written on the door of his tent. Jack of Norfolk, be not too bold, for Dickon thy master is bought and sold. Lord Stanley, who had drawn up his men at about equal distance from both armies, received messages early in the morning from both leaders desiring his immediate assistance. His policy, however, was to stand aloof to the very last moment, and he replied in each case that he would come at a convenient opportunity. Dissatisfied with this answer, Richard ordered his son to be beheaded, but was persuaded to suspend the execution of the order till the day should be decided. After a discharge of arrows on both sides, the army soon came to a hand-to-hand -hand encounter. Lord Stanley joined the Earl in the midst of the engagement, and the Earl of Northumberland, on whose support Richard had relied, stood still with all his followers and looked on. The day was going hard against the king. Norfolk fell in the thickest of the fight, and his son, the Earl of Surrey, after fighting with great valor, was surrounded and taken prisoner. Richard endeavored to single out his adversary, whose position on the field was pointed out to him. He suddenly rushed upon Henry's bodyguard and unhorsed successively two of his attendants, one of whom, the Earl's standard-bearer, fell dead to the ground. The Earl himself was in great danger, but that Sir William Stanley, who had hitherto abstained from joining the combat, now endeavored to surround the king with his force of three thousand men. Richard perceived that he was betrayed, and crying treason, treason, endeavored only to sell his life as dearly as possible. Overpowered by numbers, he fell dead in the midst of his enemies. The battered crown that had fallen from Richard's head was picked up upon the field of battle, and Sir William Stanley placed it upon the head of the conqueror, who was saluted as king by his whole army. The body of Richard, on the other hand, was treated with a degree of indignity which expressed but too plainly 
the disgust excited in the minds of the people by his inhuman tyranny. It was stripped naked and thrown upon a horse, a halter being placed round the neck, and in that fashion carried into Leicester, where it was buried with little honour in the Greyfriars Church. Such was the end of the last King of England of the line of the Plantagenets. In warlike qualities he was not inferior to the best of his predecessors, but his rule was such as alienated the hearts of the greater part of his subjects, and caused him to be remembered as a monster. In person, too, he is represented to have been deformed, with the right shoulder higher than the left, and he is traditionally regarded as a hunchback. But it may be that even his bodily defects were exaggerated after he was gone. Stories got abroad that he was born with teeth, and hair coming down to his shoulders, and that his birth was attended by other circumstances altogether repugnant to the order of nature. One fact that can hardly be a misstatement is that he was small of stature, which makes it all the more remarkable that in this last battle he overthrew in personal encounter a man of great size and strength named Sir John Cheney. He was, in fact, a great soldier king, in whom alike the valor and the violence of his race had been matured and brought to a climax by civil wars and family dissensions. It was inevitable that kings of this sort should give place to kings of a different stamp. His rival Henry, henceforth King Henry the Seventh, inaugurated a new era in which prudence and policy were made to serve the interests of peace and secure the throne, even with a doubtful title, against the convulsions to which it had been hitherto exposed. By his marriage with the Princess Elizabeth, he was considered to have at length united the houses of York and Lancaster, and he left to his son Henry the Eighth, who succeeded him, a title almost as free from dispute or cavil as that of any king in more recent times. The civil wars, in fact, had worked themselves out. The two powerful nobility had destroyed each other in these internecine struggles, and as the lords of each party were attainted by turns, their great estates were confiscated and passed into the hands of the crown. This gave the Tudor sovereigns an advantage which they knew well how to use. Watchful and suspicious of their nobility, they understood, as few other sovereigns did, the value of property. And under Henry the Eighth, the English monarchy attained a power and absolutism unparalleled before or since. End of section 41. Section 42 of The Houses of Lancaster and York by James Gairdner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 11, General View of European History, Part 1. The civil wars in England, of which we have now related the history, are commonly called the Wars of the Roses, from the fact that the House of Lancaster assumed a red rose for its badge, and the House of York a white rose. Shakespeare, who has preserved in his plays a number of historical traditions, the authority of which we cannot always verify, represents in one interesting scene at the beginning of the struggle, the lords of both parties meeting in the temple gardens, and each plucking a rose, red or white, to indicate his attachment to the Duke of Somerset or York. Whether such a scene actually took place and gave rise to those party badges, it is impossible to say, but there is no doubt that the Yorkists were known as the party of the White Rose and their opponents as that of the Red. When at length Henry the Seventh, the representative of the House of Lancaster, attained the crown, and married the daughter of Edward the Fourth, the marriage was spoken of as the Union of the Roses. This union was the first step in England toward that strengthening of the powers of the crown, which was now absolutely necessary for the restoration of order. Since the days of Edward the Third, all authority had been weak because the sovereign power itself was weak. 
it was the weakness of despotic caprice in richard the second of usurpation and civil war under the house of lancaster and of internal division in the house of york and all these causes combined to make the fifteenth century a period of violence and disorder approaching at times to anarchy under the steady rule of the tudors england recovered from this confusion the claims of the two rival houses were blended the turbulent nobility were kept in strict subjection law was administered with generally an impartial hand peace was for the most part cherished and commerce was protected disencumbered of the rule of any french territory except calais the english grew strong at home and became a nation compact and united under a race of sovereigns who were powerful enough to throw off the spiritual dominion of rome and to take a leading position among the potentates of europe but that which occurred in england occurred in other countries also what are called the middle ages came to an end with the fifteenth century a time of universal disorder in the midst of which however a new order was gradually forming itself and gaining strength the decay of feudalism in fact paved the way for the reorganization of europe great kingdoms sprang up where formerly had existed a number of principalities held only in nominal subjection to a feudal sovereign or whereas in england a too powerful nobility had almost made themselves independent of the crown france first emerged from the confusion afterwards spain and england by the end of the fifteenth century the nations of western europe had settled down into nearly the same relative positions and occupied nearly the same territory that they have since retained the connection between english and continental history during this period is a subject which has not been altogether lost sight of in the preceding pages but some general remarks on the progress of european nations may be desirable before we bring this work to a conclusion there is at once a parallelism and a contrast during this period between the career of england and that of france at no time were the fortunes of the two nations more closely linked together the very same events form during a considerable part of the fifteenth century the leading features in the history of both but the same events have in either case an opposite significance the triumph of one country was the abasement of the other and the recovery of the second was accompanied by the demoralization of the first there is moreover quite an extraordinary amount of coincidence and at the same time contrast between the circumstances by which the contemporary kings of england and of france were surrounded during the whole period of our narrative the reign of charles the sixth who came to the throne just three years after richard the second corresponds to those of three successive kings in england at his accession he and richard were both under age but charles led his armies in person when he was fourteen while richard though not deficient in courage seldom asserted himself in any way except at a crisis like wat tyler's rebellion the complaint in richard's case was that he allowed himself to be governed by favourites which was perfectly true at those times when he was not coerced by his uncles toward the end of his reign however richard weary of his long subjection laid claim to absolute power while charles about the same time became deranged and was obliged to surrender the government to his uncles after this the french court became divided by factions which left the kingdom an easy prey to the invader and the same king who when a boy had alarmed all england by the fleet he had collected at slush was obliged in his latter days to make an english king his heir and invest him with all the powers of royalty to the exclusion of his own son but the parallelism of which we have spoken is more striking after the death of charles the sixth when by a singular coincidence the reigns of the english and french sovereigns correspond during three successions exactly to a year 
with circumstances either so much alike or so contrasted that they may be shown in parallel columns as follows. In 1422 in France, Charles VII succeeds his father Charles VI, and France loses an imbecile king and gets a stronger who displays great qualities as a ruler. In his time, France recovers Normandy and Guienne and deprives England of all her French dominions except Calais. In England, in 1422, Henry VI succeeds his father, Henry V. England loses a strong king and gets an infant who exhibits no capacity for government even when he grows up. In his time, France recovers Normandy and Guienne and deprives England of all her French dominions except Calais. In 1461, Louis XI succeeds his father, Charles VII, and a politic king consolidates the French monarchy, notwithstanding powerful combinations against him. While in the same year, 1461, Edward IV deposes Henry VI. A military king displaces one too weak to rule, but holds the throne insecurely, and is temporarily displaced himself. In 1483, Charles VIII succeeds his father, Louis XI, and a minority, but France being now settled, the consolidation of her dominions is completed in a few years by the annexation of Brittany. While in England in 1483, Edward V succeeds his father, Edward IV, a minority, but it does not last three months. Richard III usurps the crown, but even his reign of tyranny and violence only lasts two years, and Henry VII, who succeeds him, is for a long time troubled with rebellions. Of all the great feudal lords of France, the Dukes of Burgundy were by far the most powerful. The duchy itself was one of the richest parts of France, but the Dukes also possessed Franche-Comté, the free county of Burgundy, which they held of the empire and not of the French crown. And to these possessions had been added ever since 1384 some of the most flourishing provinces of the Netherlands, which were acquired by Duke Philip the Bold in right of his wife Margaret, daughter of the Count of Flanders. These provinces, full of populous towns such as Ghent, Bruges, and Antwerp, seats of the largest commerce and manufactures in the world, were likewise held of the empire. Hence the Dukes of Burgundy became so exceedingly powerful that instead of being subject to the kings of France, they at times held those kings in practical subjection to themselves. But after the death of Charles the Bold, Louis XI seized upon the duchy and even the Franche-Comté, which he succeeded in uniting to the French crown. The rest of the dominions of the House of Burgundy were conveyed to the Archduke Maximilian, son of the Emperor Frederick III, by his marriage with Charles the Bold's daughter, so that the Netherlands came into the possession of the House of Austria, an ambitious and grasping family in whom the empire itself ultimately became hereditary and with it under Charles V in the 16th century, was joined the sovereignty of Spain. End of section 42。section 43 of the Houses of Lancaster and York by James Gairdner。this LibriVox recording is in the public domain。read by Pamela Nagami。chapter 11 。General View of European History, Part Two. The Spanish Peninsula at the beginning of the 15th century was divided into the four Christian kingdoms of Castile, Aragon, Navarre, and Portugal, besides the Moorish kingdom of Granada. The different kings had wars among each other, and sometimes disputes with regard to the succession at home. But in 1458, John II, king of Navarre, succeeded to the crown of Aragon, and on his death in 1479, he was succeeded by his son Ferdinand, who with his wife Isabella, the heiress of Castile, 
had already been proclaimed joint sovereign of that country. In this manner the three Christian kingdoms of Spain would have been united, but after the death of King John, Navarre became again a separate kingdom, and owing to French interest was kept so for another century. Ferdinand and Isabella, however, united Aragon and Castile, turned their arms against the Moors, conquered Granada, and became masters of nearly the whole peninsula except Portugal. That country, which has maintained its independence to this day, became great in another way, by maritime expeditions. Alfonso V made several descents upon the coast of Africa, conquering Ceuta, Tangiers, and other places. Portuguese enterprise discovered the island of Madeira in the beginning of the 15th century, and afterwards the Azores, then gradually explored the western coast of Africa by Cape Bojador and Cape Verde, until in 1497 Vasco da Gama doubled the Cape of Good Hope and made his way to India. The discovery of the New World by Columbus in 1492 was unquestionably stimulated by the knowledge of what the Portuguese had done before him. But while the Western kingdoms all passed through a period of weakness and became stronger, the states situated in the center of Europe remained in the old confusion, and in the East Christianity was actually receding before the armies of the Turk. Italy was parceled out into small states. In the north there was the Dukedom of Milan and the Republics of Venice, Genoa, and Florence, besides some minor principalities. In the center were the states of the Church, of which the Pope was sovereign. In the south were the two separate kingdoms of Naples and Sicily. The principalities in the north belonged to the Empire. The center of Italy was governed by the Church, the south was a bone of contention between foreign princes. Milan was erected into a dukedom by the Emperor Wenceslas in 1395. It had long been under the dominion of the Visconti, who then became its dukes, a family noted for deeds of violence and cruelty. But on the death of Philip Maria Visconti in 1445, the dukedom was claimed by his son-in-law, Francesco Sforza who, after some fighting, obtained it and became the head of another line. This Francesco, who was the most noted soldier of his day, had fought by turns in the service of Visconti, the Pope, and the Venetians, and, generally speaking, had taken part in all the Italian wars of his time, sometimes on one side and sometimes on the opposite. He had fought against Pope Eugenius IV in the name of the Council of Baal, till the prudent pontiff turned him into a friend by making him gonfaloniere, or standard-bearer of the church. He had been out of favor with the Duke of Milan, but the Duke found the need of his assistance, appointed him captain-general of his army, and gave him his daughter in marriage. After the Duke's death, the Milanese wished to form themselves into a republic like several of the neighboring states, but Sforza formed a league with his old enemies, the Venetians, laid siege to the city, and forced it to surrender for fear of starvation. He was by then proclaimed duke, and his alliance was sought not only by the princes of Italy, but by Louis XI of France and by the king of Aragon. His sons and grandsons were dukes after him, but scarcely sustained his greatness, and in the last year of the century, the Duke Ludovico Maria Sforza was taken prisoner and his duchy seized by Louis XII of France. In Naples, as we have seen, the House of Anjou disputed the throne for some time with the family of Durazzo. Afterwards, the kings of Aragon, who ruled in Sicily, laid claim to Naples also, and the House of Anjou was unable to vindicate its pretensions against them. King René at first attempted to make good his claims, but was soon driven out and left with a barren title. A bastard branch of the royal family of Aragon then for some time succeeded, but in the end this kingdom, as well as Sicily, came into the hands of Ferdinand the Catholic. Thus, ultimately, the greater part of Italy fell under the power either of France or Spain, 
and so it continued for a long time afterwards. The two maritime republics of Genoa and Venice did little to avert this result. The former, a prey to civil dissensions, submitted in the end of the 14th century to France, and never completely regained its independence till 1528. Its territory on the mainland was but a narrow fringe along the coast, but it possessed the island of Corsica, and in the Grecian archipelago the island of Chios. It had also made Cyprus tributary, and colonized the Crimea and other settlements on the Black Sea. But the fall of Constantinople in 1453, which the Genoese of all European powers made the greatest efforts to prevent, deprived them of their colonies on the Black Sea, and thereby crippled their commerce. Their rivals, the Venetians, also suffered from the advance of the Turks in Greece and on the shores of the Adriatic. Venice, however, did not succumb, as Genoa did, to any other great European power, and she was so formidable in the year 1508 that France, Spain, and Germany combined together in the League of Cambrai to humble her. Of the history of the popes, we have already said so much that a very few words may suffice to complete it. We have seen how even after the papal see was brought back from Avignon to Rome, the French party were strong enough to maintain a series of anti-popes at Avignon until the schism was terminated by the proceedings of the Council of Constance. But factions prevailed at Rome, and Pope Eugenius IV took part with the Orsini family against the Colonnas. He also came into collision with the Council of Baal, which was assembled in 1431 to promote a union of the Greek Church with the Roman. Eugenius sought to dissolve this council, with the council maintaining the principle asserted by the previous council of Constance, declared itself superior to the Pope, and ultimately deposed him, and set up Amadeus, Duke of Savoy, in his place as Pope Felix V. Eugenius, however, convoked another council at Ferrara, which he afterwards removed to Florence, and therein pronounced the council of Baal heretical, and the anti-Pope Felix a schismatic. Felix, indeed, was only recognized in Hungary and a few of the minor European states, and after the death of Eugenius, he was persuaded to resign. After this, there is little that is remarkable in the history of the papacy for some time, except, in 1458, a great scholar and traveler, Aeneas Silvius Piccolomini, was made pope by the name of Pius II who, like all the other popes of this period, made great but ineffectual efforts to unite Europe against the Turks. The princes of Europe were engrossed with their own affairs, and the authority of the Holy See was no longer what it had been before the popes took up their abode at Avignon. We have already spoken of the conquests of the Sultan Bajazet, of the great battle of Nicopolis in which he defeated the flower of European chivalry, and of his final overthrow by Timur the Tartar. This saved for a while from extinction the old eastern empire, which had continued from the days of Constantine, and Soliman I, the son of Bajazet, recovered the greater part of Asia from Tamerlane, by ceding to the emperor Manuel the conquests of his father in Europe. But his successors renewed their aggressions on Christendom, which would have been still more effective but for family quarrels among the Ottoman princes themselves. The armies of Amurath II were defeated when they invaded Hungary by Johannes Corvinus Haniades, waywoad of Transylvania. The prince of Albania, at the same time, threw off the yoke and succeeded in maintaining for three and twenty years the independence of his country. The name of this prince was George Castriot, but he is better known in history by that of Skanderbeg, meaning in Turkish the great Alexander, which was given him in compliment to his military genius. He certainly did not a little, while he lived, to divert the forces of the Turk from Europe generally. Yet, in the year 1453, Mohammed II took by assault Constantinople, and the Eastern Empire came to an end. <laughs>
In a few years more he took Athens, Thebes, and Corinth, and conquered the Morea. Finally, after the death of Skanderbeg, he made himself master of Albania and Negropont, invaded Croatia, and sent a fleet across the Adriatic, which surprised Otranto. Italy and Europe generally heard of his doings with terror. Of all European kingdoms, Hungary was most exposed to this invader, and Hungary had not unfrequently troubles of its own in the nature of a disputed succession to encourage his audacity. The crowns of Hungary and of Bohemia were united with the Empire of Germany under Sigismund, of whose contests both with the Turks and with the Hussites we have already spoken. But a party in each of these countries sought rather to promote a union with Poland. After the death of Sigismund, Albert of Austria, who had married his daughter Elizabeth, succeeded to the throne of both kingdoms, and became emperor as well. But he died within two years. At the moment of his death he was without an heir, but his queen Elizabeth was with child, and gave birth to a son who was called Ladislaus the Posthumous, and succeeded to the throne of Bohemia. The Hungarians, however, offered their crown to another Ladislaus, the king of Poland, with whom Elizabeth, so long as she lived, in vain attempted to dispute the succession on her son's behalf. Under this Polish king and the brave general John Haniades, the Hungarians succeeded for some time in repelling the Turks. But being incited by the Pope to violate a truce with the enemy, the king met with a great defeat and perished in battle near Varna. After his death, Haniades was made regent for Ladislaus the Posthumous, who was still a minor, and invaded the dominions of the Emperor Frederick III to make him deliver up the young prince, who had been put under his protection. Young Ladislaus was restored, but those by whom he was surrounded caused Haniades to be dismissed from the regency, and some years after goaded the hero's sons into a conspiracy which cost the eldest his life. The people, however, were indignant, and on the death of Ladislaus raised Matthias Corvinus, the second son of Haniades, to the throne. Like his father, he was a brave warrior, and he regained from the Turks the strong town of Jaisa in Bosnia. But unfortunately, the Turks were not his only enemy and he was compelled to make war by turns against the king of Bohemia, the king of Poland, and the emperor. And although a king of very noble qualities, and very successful in all his campaigns, it was perhaps a happiness for his country that he left no son to continue his line in the face of so many adversaries. The crown of Hungary was again united with that of Bohemia, and in the following century, both crowns came to the House of Austria. The kingdom of Poland had long been exposed to attack from another set of infidels, the hordes inhabiting Lithuania. But in 1386, the princess Hedwig, having succeeded to the crown, took for her husband Jogello, Grand Duke of Lithuania, on condition that he would be baptized. This act was followed by the conversion of the Lithuanians generally. Jogello became king of Poland by the name of Ladislas V, and the country was no longer exposed to pagan inroads. But he and his successors had fierce wars with the Teutonic Knights of Prussia. Germany had been for centuries under the rule of the emperors, successors of Charlemagne, who was considered to have revived the old empire of Rome. Theoretically, the emperor was in temporal matters what the pope was in spiritual, the head of all Western Europe, or rather of the world. But these proud pretensions had never been justified by fact since the days of Charlemagne himself. For a long time the empire had been united with the old kingdom of Germany, and the emperor had been elected by a diet of German princes. He commonly received three crowns in succession. First, a silver crown at Aix-la-Chapelle, which was the crown of Germany afterwards what is called the iron crown of Lombardy at Milan. It is of silver, but it has a circle of iron within it. And finally, the golden crown of empire at Rome. This last crown was placed upon his head by the Pope, 
and until he received it he was not fully entitled to the name of emperor. Till then he was only called King of the Romans. For a long time the emperors had asserted their dominion over Italy, but now this was little more than a tradition. Even over Germany their rule was no longer what it had once been. The revenues attached to the imperial dignity were totally inadequate, and the electors were fain to offer it to foreign princes able to support the burden. The German princes cared little for their sovereign, and the emperor himself cared more for his own patrimony than for the interests of Germany. Wenceslaus, who was king of Bohemia as well as emperor, seldom visited the rest of his dominions, and was deposed in 1400, the year after his brother-in-law, Richard II, was deposed in England. Sigismund, the brother of Wenceslas, was a more active ruler, but even he cared more for Hungary than for Germany. Still more indifferent to the affairs of the empire was Frederick III, who was elected emperor in 1440, and who made it his principal aim to advance the interests of the House of Austria. He created the Duchy of Austria into an archduchy, married his son Maximilian to Mary, the rich heiress of Burgundy, and got him elected King of the Romans during his own lifetime, so as to ensure his succession to the empire after his death. The policy which he thus initiated was continued by Maximilian and his other descendants. The empire was preserved in the possession of the family, and the fortunes of the House of Austria were continually improved by politic marriages. But Germany became more and more disunited, each of her princes being virtually supreme in his own dominions. End of section 43. Section 44 of the Houses of Lancaster and York by James Gairdner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 12. Conclusion. The 15th century was not an age of really great men. Amid schisms in the church, wars, rebellions, and disputed successions in every kingdom of Europe, it seems to have been impossible for any mind to realize to itself one grand idea, to work out one great work, or to set forth one great thought. The best minds of the age looked back upon the past and regretted the chivalry that was passing away. Order was the one great need of the time, and as yet men could see no order except of a kind already past recovery, which they were vainly endeavoring to restore. So for the peace of the church they burned heretics and put witches to open penance, while adhering to the traditions of a moribund chivalry they plunged Europe into war and anarchy. The one direction in which there was a visible movement in men's minds was in a revival of ancient learning. Scholars were recovering lost literature to the world, and the classic writers of ancient Rome were studied and imitated in a way they had not been before. Greek, too, began to engage more attention in Europe after the fall of Constantinople, for refugees carried the language and the literature into Italy and elsewhere. The art of printing, first used in Germany about the year 1440 and brought into England by Caxton in 1474, helped to multiply copies of the best ancient authors. In England, after the days of Gower and Chaucer, we had very little literature that deserved the name. The principal poet of the succeeding age was John Lydgate, a monk of Berry, whose small lyric effusions, though not altogether contemptible, scarcely rank above mediocrity. It is remarkable, however, that two foreign princes, James I of Scotland and Charles, Duke of Orléans, each of whom was for many years detained a prisoner in England, each contributed to his native literature poetry that was far from commonplace. In religion, men testified what was going on beneath the surface rather by acts than by words. Men who felt more deeply than their neighbors some neglected phase of Christianity drifted away from the authority of the church. There were the flagellants in Italy, the Lollards in England, the Hussites in Bohemia, 
but their zeal was found to be incompatible even with civil peace, and they were met by a spirit of persecution in which it is to be lamented that some of the noblest minds of the day concurred. Such was John Gerson at the Council of Constance, the man who in defiance of danger tore to rags all the miserable special pleadings by which the creatures of John the fearless Duke of Burgundy sought to justify or extenuate the murder of his rival Orléans. Even he, so bold and upright in defense of public morals, took the lead in the persecution of Hus and Jerome of Prague. A quieter mind was that of Thomas a Kempis, to whom, as it is generally believed, the world is indebted for the exquisitely beautiful book, still so popular, upon the imitation of Christ. Nothing can excel it as an exposition of that pure and peaceful devotion for which monasticism still offered a safe asylum amid the perverseness and errors of the time. Outside the cloister, zeal was sure to be persecuted, even if it endeavored to vindicate authority. Such was the fate of Reginald Peacock, Bishop of Chichester, a man not less remarkable for his vigor of intellect than for his love of toleration, who wrote a number of treatises in English in defense of the church against the Lollards. His object was to win over heretics by reason instead of by the fires of persecution. His arguments generally are remarkably clear and lucid, tending to show that the Lollard position was founded upon an undue deference to the mere letter of Scripture, and that the Bible was not given us to supersede the use of our natural reason. But this mode of treatment satisfied no one. During the short lull in the Civil War in 1457, not long before the procession of the reconciled leaders of St. Paul's, Bishop Peacock was accused of heresy, forced to recant for fear of martyrdom, and deprived of his bishopric. The church declined to be defended in the spirit of toleration. Thus, whatever was noble was distressed and persecuted. Commerce and money-getting went on, and the spirits of men, broken by invariable disappointment when they attempted anything higher, became generally sordid and mercenary. Kings grasped at territory instead of money, but in England they soonest tired of the game, and even they in the end joined in the general pursuit of wealth in preference to honor or reputation. Edward IV first set the example of trafficking in war, which Lord Bacon notes as a feature of the policy of Henry VII. Both these kings raised great supplies from their own subjects, and then accepted money from the enemy to forbear fighting. But from the commercial enterprise of the day arose those discoveries which in the end perhaps had most influence in the formation of a new era. New coasts, new seas, new islands, and in the end a complete new world, were successively revealed. The thoughts of men were expanded, their imaginations fired with new ideas, old philosophies insensibly passed away as the ambition, the enterprise, and the avarice of a new generation found channels which had been hitherto unknown. The world, even the material world, was found to be much larger than had been supposed. As for the world unseen, was it likely that popes and councils had taken the true measure of that? End of section 44. Read by Pamela Nagami, M.D., in Encino, California, February 1st, 2023. End of the Houses of Lancaster and York with the Conquest and Loss of France by James Gairdner.